glad that all of you are here today and uh, that you have come and uh, decided to come and worship with us today. We want to welcome you here today to Painesville Assembly of God and especially any guests that we have with us today. If you're a guest with us, we want to uh, welcome you and we encourage you to take out a connection card right in the pew in front of you. There's a connection card there. We're all about connecting people to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we believe that uh, growth happens uh, when you be a part of the body of Christ, a part of a, a, a local church. And, uh, and so if you don't have a church that you call your church home, a church family, we would love to be able to connect you here. And so if you'll just take that card and fill out the information that's there, uh, we would love to be able to, uh, to receive that information and reach out to you, give you a little gift before you leave today uh, as well, and more information about our church and connect you uh, to our fellowship and to our family. So if you take that card, after you filled it out, you can do one of two things. Either you can drop it in the offering when it goes by in a few moments, or uh, you can take it out to our welcome center uh, right out on our foyer. It's right in the middle of the foyer, just on the other side of the back wall of our sanctuary in the center there, and someone will be there to receive that from you and give you a gift today. If you're a regular attender, go ahead and pass those black attendance pads down and just write your first and last name unless your information has changed and that helps us today to know who's with us today and uh, who we may need to follow up with who we haven't seen in a while. Uh, this morning, uh, we have the opportunity to be a part of uh, the dedication of a baby this morning. How many of you know the family is a divine institution ordained by God at the very beginning of time? How many you know children are a gift from the Lord, aren't they? And Psalm 127.3 proclaims that children are a heritage from the Lord, an offspring, a reward from Him. And uh, see, children are a heritage from the Lord, committed to Him uh, and, and committed by Him to their parents for care, provision, protection, and spiritual training. And it's good that parents recognize these obligations and responsibilities and make every effort to carry them out. And so today I'm going to invite David and Jessica Huffman today to come. As they come today, they're acknowledging uh, these responsibilities as they come before us today. And they're coming with their beautiful family today. And, uh, and today they're coming to not only dedicate themselves to the Lord, but they're coming to dedicate their daughter, Olivia Grace Huffman, to the Lord. Isn't she a cutie? Look at her. <laughs> she is beautiful. She is beautiful. Welcome. Welcome. So glad that you all are here today. I mean, you know, Olivia is a gift from the Lord, isn't she? She is just a beautiful little gift. You're a beautiful little gift from God. And God has created her with a unique personality. He has given her unique gifts, unique talents and abilities, all of that. He has prepackaged in this little bundle of joy. And he's placed them in your family, David and Jessica. He's placed them in your family, placed her as a gift in your family to raise and to steward and to bring her up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And you know, from the first moments that a child is born, families begin to imprint upon their children, upon a child's life, spiritual beliefs. And as important as it is to care for our children physically and emotionally and to provide for them and protect for them, it's also important to provide for them spiritually. And so today, through this act of dedication, you are showing that you understand the importance that uh, it's important to dedicate her unto the Lord and to provide for her spiritually as well. You see, when it comes to dedication, we see several examples in the scriptures before. In 1 Samuel 1, 27 and 28, Hannah uh, came and she presented her son Samuel back to the Lord. And she said, I prayed for this child. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him, so now I give him to the Lord. All the days of his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And then it says that he worshiped the Lord there. Yeah, and so we see that dedication is all about saying, Lord, we recognize that Olivia, as much as she is ours, we recognize that she is yours, Lord. And so we offer her back to you. We say, Lord, we dedicate her to you. And in Luke 18, 15 through 16, we understand that people did the same thing in the New Testament, not only in the Old Testament, but they recognized in the New Testament how important it was. And it says people were also bringing their babies to Jesus, and he gave the, they gave them to him to touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him, and Jesus called the children to him and said, no, 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 let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of the Lord belongs to such as these. And so today, by dedicating Olivia to the Lord, you're publicly recognizing that she is a gift from the Lord. You're presenting her today for the Lord's blessing 
upon her life for his protection as Jesus came and they touched him that you want Jesus touch on this little child on her life for her to be all that God has for her to be that you're also committing to train her up in the fear and admonition and the training of the Lord and today by participating in dedication it marks your recognition that not only does she belong to the Lord but also that you are accepting that responsibility you see Deuteronomy 6 6 through 7 says these commandments I give you today they're to be upon your heart it says impress them upon your children talk about them when you sit at home when you lock or walk along the road when you lie down and when you get up and so you're recognizing your responsibilities as parents in the training and bringing her up in an atmosphere and in a home that allows her to be able to see how much Jesus loves her and his plan for her little life. And also dedication is a surrendering of her to the Lord that she will walk out God's plan. I know we all have plans for our children. I'm a, we're parents as well and we certainly have certain things that we see and we say, oh, I'd love this for my child. But you know, the most important thing is to say, God, what is your plan? What's your desire? And so as Olivia Grace grows up, we say, God, what do you have pre-planned for this little girl? And Father, we surrender her to your will, and we want to be a part of the process of helping her to discover how you have made her and created her, and to help her discover what God's plan is for her life. And so today, if it's your intention to present Olivia Grace to the Lord today, and to pledge yourselves to bring her up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, please answer we do to the following promises. Do you here this day recognize that Olivia Grace is a gift from the Lord and to give heartfelt thanks for his blessing? And to you this day, dedicate Olivia to the Lord her gave, who gave him, or gave her to you both. And do you here this day pledge as parents that you'll model a relationship with Jesus and that you'll set for her an example of what it means to follow the Lord? And do you this day ask God's blessing upon Olivia Grace today to guide her, to guard her, and to direct her through all her years? Church, you have a commitment today as well. We recognize that this family needs the body of Christ to come along and to to, to be with them in this process, to model a relationship with Jesus, to pray for them as parents, and because uh, we know that parenting is not easy, to encourage her and to encourage her, her spiritual growth as a young child. And so, church, today, if it's your commitment to join with this family in prayer, will you stretch your hands forward as we pray a prayer of dedication and recognize our responsibility to pray for this family and for Olivia Grace today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for this family. We thank you today for Olivia Grace Huffman. She is a gift from you, and we recognize that. God, you have planned great things for her life. Lord, you have created her and knit her together with wonderful personality and talents and abilities and, and God, all the wonderful things that make up who she is and what your plan is for her life. Father, we pray a prayer of dedication over her. We dedicate her unto you. Pray for your protection today over her life, that you will guide and guard her little heart and her mind in Christ Jesus. And that, Father, you will one day, as she grows in you, help her, Lord, to understand how much you love her and connect her, God, to that relationship with you. Father, we bless her today. We bless her today with your blessing. And we pray, Lord, that your hand and your presence will always be with her. Father, we just pray for the Huffman family today, for David and Jessica as parents. We pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon them, that you will give them wisdom as parents today, that you will guide and you will lead them and you will guard them all the days, uh, Lord, of their life. You will help them as they raise, uh, Lord, all of their children and as they raise Olivia, that, God, your hand will be upon them. You will give them wisdom and you will give them direction and you will just fill this family with your love and your mercy and your grace. Father, we love you and bless you, and today we dedicate Olivia Grace Huffman to you. She is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and turn around and show her off to everybody. Come on, let's give them a hand today. We have a special little gift that we'd like to give, our first Bible, and uh, also a certificate of the dedication today. Give them a hand one more time today.
Well, good morning. I have uh, a few announcements to share with you this morning before we take up our morning tithes and offerings. First, uh, I want you to be aware that uh, we are having a meeting of our young adult ministry this evening. And so if you're between the ages of 18 to 25, then you can come on out tonight. We're going to be meeting in the uh, Children's Worship Center. Um, we're going to be uh, having uh, breakfast food. So bring a side or a dessert to share and uh, come on out for some time of fellowship and Bible study. That is uh, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. tonight. I also wanted to let you know that on Friday, uh, the 17th, Forever Young is getting together. That's for those 55 years and older. They're getting together at the home of Leah and Rita, Lee and Rita Signs, sorry, from 6 to 8 p.m. They're going to enjoy hamburgers and hot dogs. They ask that you please provide a side dish or a dessert to share and bring a swimsuit if you'd like to take a swim in the pool. Um, they ask that if you plan to attend, you can sign up in the foyer, and if you have any questions, you can contact John or Annette Millsaps. Next Sunday after church um, at 4 p.m., we are having a summer baptism and church picnic, and uh, so if you have accepted the Lord in your heart, but you have yet to be water baptized and you would like to, you can still um, sign up for that today. Uh, the Lord uh, was baptized as he walked with us um, on earth, and so we follow his example in water baptism. Water baptism isn't necessary for salvation. Rather, it's the outward act uh, uh, that confirms the inward that has already taken place. It's the outward act that publicly displays um, your relationship with Christ. There's also a lot of outreach and uh, different things for you to get involved with. And so if you uh, aren't serving or involved in the church, then there are plenty of ways for you to get involved. Um, as far as uh, Impact Club is a club that we do at Heritage Middle School that you can be involved with. And if that's something that you would like to be involved with, you can get in contact with myself. Uh, I know Pastor Steve in the kids ministry has a lot of areas that you can get involved with as well. And so you can uh, see the handout in the bulletin and that in and get in contact with him. Uh, there's going to be a uh, choir happening uh, that Pastor Kerry asks that you can sign up for one a choir feature song um, that's going to be taking place, as well as an opportunity for you to teach English as a second language or uh, serve in child care in that area as well. So there are plenty of outreaches and, and ministry opportunities happening for you to be able to sign up with here at Painesville Assembly of God. Now we're going to continue worshiping the Lord through our giving. Now I'm going to invite our ushers, if they would, to make their way forward now as we continue to give. There are multiple ways that you can give. You can give here in person. You can give online or through our app as well. If you haven't downloaded the Painesville Assembly of God app, we encourage that you do. You can see the bulletin on there as well as a calendar of events. You can give and you can follow along with this morning's sermon notes on there as well. Let's pray over our offering. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we recognize that everything that you've given us is yours. We are just stewards or managers of what you have placed in our care, and Lord, we hold those things with open hands. God, we recognize that it's all yours, and so we give back unto you so that we can see others come to know you and come to love you as we do. In Christ's mighty name we pray, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving. I want to let you know just an update on where we are with our Tanzania uh, church planting school that we are raising money for and uh, hope to have by the first week in, uh, in November so that when a uh, missionary to Tanzania uh, uh, is here, when our missionary comes to Tanzania, that we can uh, present him uh, with a, uh, a check. We can present him and say, hey, we have raised enough money to build a church planting school in Tanzania. Our goal is $33,000 to raise for that, and we are over $14,000 now thanks to your giving and faithfulness to the Lord. So we are well on our way. And uh, again, I thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord, and I just know that many lives, many 
church planters are going to be raised up to be able to go to the unreached people groups, not only in Tanzania, but in the surrounding nations in Africa as well. And uh, so thank you so much for your faithfulness as we continue to raise uh, funds for this uh, very worthy uh, project there in, uh, in Tanzania. And so I appreciate that. Uh, well, how many of you that, uh, that are married remember your first date? Does anybody remember their first date? Yeah. I remember my first date with Jamie. Uh, we were in college, and uh, uh, she was a freshman. I was a junior. We had already gone through our first semester, and so second semester was launched in January, and we had been going to church together. I had a car, and so I was able to... Uh, take a group of friends to church, and she was a part of that, uh, that friend group, and then we got involved because we both love drama and a, in, a, in a Christmas production, and so I went home over Christmas break, and man, there was this girl I just could not get out of my mind. Man, I just couldn't get her out of my, but I was too nervous to ask her out. So I went through almost the entire month of January where I had friends that were kind of encouraged, hey, I think she'd say yes, and I'm thinking, I don't know if she'd say yes. I, I, don't, I don't know. And that was before I knew that she had already told her mom when, he asked, when, when her mom asked her why, who she was going to church with. And she said, oh, this guy who has a car, he's arrogant. I would never date him. <laughs> See what happens? Hang around me long enough. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was nervous. And so then I finally got up the courage, and she said yes. And so on January uh, 27th, we went out on our first date, and, uh, and, and so I was trying to plan the whole thing, and we went to a restaurant near Valley Forge in Downingtown uh, area, X and area. We went to this place called Eastside Mario's. It was an Italian joint that was really loud. I love Italian food, and, and uh, really loud, and, and, you know, just this great atmosphere, and I thought, well, I'm going to plan. We'll go to see a movie afterwards. And the movie that we went to see was a movie that had just come out about that time called Mr. Holland's Opus. How many have ever seen Mr. Holland's Opus? Yeah. Mr. Holland's Opus, if you haven't seen it, it's about a high school music teacher. Now, Mr. Holland didn't really want to be a high school music teacher. In fact, he wanted to be a great composer. That's what he really wanted to, to set out for. And his plan, when he was about at the age of 30, his plan was to be a high school music teacher for a few years, kind of help pay some of the bills and those kind of things. And on the side, he would work on his opus. He would, he would work on his masterpiece. And he fully expected that his fame and his lasting legacy would be in his opus, in his, his masterpiece, in, in what he was putting together. But how many of you know things don't always turn out as we plan, right? All of us have plans. Sometimes when we're young, we've got big dreams, we have big plans. Things didn't turn out the way that Mr. Holland had planned. And so due to a variety of factors, he found himself trapped in his position as a high school music teacher. His home life was rather difficult, and he invested very heavily in his students as a music teacher. In fact, he called them to a higher standard of musical excellence than anybody ever expected that he, he could have. And, and while the entire time, he continued to work on his opus. At the age of 60, after teaching for 30 years, it became obvious that Mr. Holland would never finish his masterpiece, much less the satisfaction of having it performed Adding insult to injury, if you watch the movie, Mr. Holland was forced into early retirement. On the last day of school, his wife and his grown son helped him pack up his office. And as he walked down the halls to the parking lot, he began to hear music coming from the auditorium. And there, when he walked into the auditorium, he saw an auditorium full of people. And on the stage, the orchestra, uh, on the stage, an orchestra composed of his former students began to line all around the stage. And there, they had been practicing the opus that Mr. Holland had been composing for over three decades, but never finished. Before Mr. Holland was invited to conduct the assembled orchestra, it was pointed out that the opus, his masterpiece, wasn't the music. His opus was the body of students that he had influenced along the way, all the young men and women whose lives were enriched by their relationship with him. You know, something similar is probably true in your life. You see, a lasting legacy is something that you'll remem be remembered by, but oftentimes it's not in the things in which we think it is. It's not in the accomplishments. It's not in, in the career marks. It's in the people that we invest in. That's where true legacy comes. The true masterpiece, the true opus of our lives is the very people that we have invested in, the very people we have given ourselves 
too. And like Mr. Holland, we need to understand that, that the main thing that we're called to is not necessarily some kind of accomplishment, but we're called to invest in people. And that's especially true for us as followers of Jesus Christ. And so today as we look in the book of Galatians, as we continue in our series here that we've been in Galatians, we're going to consider a passage in which we see the Apostle Paul who is very zealous for the Galatian believers. And he's going to begin to share with us some very personal things about the ministry, the gospel-centered ministry that he did while he was there in Galatia. He's going to share with us his zealousness and his passion for the spiritual health of this people that he had come and planted a church and invested in their lives because he knows that his legacy is not about a building. It's not about something uh, tangible in terms of some kind of external accomplishment, but it's in the very people that he has led to faith in Christ that will move on and live on into eternity. And so today as we... As we take a look at this contribution, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 4, 8 to 20. You can follow along in your Bible. We'll have, the, we'll have the, a PowerPoint that will give the scripture references and those kind of things. Uh, but I encourage you, you can follow along with the app as well this morning, whatever you want to do. But we're going to take a case study, a case study of how deeply we should care about the spiritual health of others. How deeply we should care about the spiritual health of of others, and we might want to consider how we might have the same zeal, at least for one person, maybe who does not know Christ, one person in their spiritual health. For some of you, this might be a brand new idea. Perhaps you're coming and you've never heard of this before. This might be a brand new idea. Others of you, maybe you're already thinking of somebody. Perhaps it's a family member. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a parent. It could be a brother or a sister. Maybe it's a friend or someone maybe you know here at church or someone. Someone that God has been bringing into your life. Maybe somebody at work. So we're going to look today at Paul's spiritual, his his passion for the Galatian spiritual health. And since we've already spent quite a bit of time already discussing the dangers of the Galatians as they they were being tricked or or led to go back to relying on the law for their salvation, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time today discussing those dynamics again. But rather, we're going to take a look at this this passage because we're going to see as Paul begins by laying out some of his fears about the Galatians. Galatians 4, 8. Here it is. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. Now this is telling us something about the culture, the Roman culture there in the region of Galatia. See, before the believers in Galatia had come to know the one and true living God, they weren't free to do what they wanted. In fact, they were actually enslaved to false gods. They they worshipped false gods, a Roman culture that had a whole lot of idolatry. They had a lot of gods and goddesses. If you know anything about Greek history, Greek mythology, there was a lot of gods and goddesses. And this was the culture of the day. The culture of the day was not one of atheism, but rather it was one of worshipping many gods and goddesses. They believed that, that there was some type of spirituality in, in it, and because of that, it drove their behavior. It drove their, their ways of worship. It drove their rituals. It drove the way that they ate. It drove them to do certain things, oftentimes into sexual immorality and other things, as acts of worship to please their gods or be pleasing to their gods. There was a whole lot of idolatry, so the people were not free, but in fact, they were enslaved to the idols in which they worshiped. This was the culture in which they found themselves in. And so the Apostle Paul says, when you did not know God, you were not free. There are some that that believe even today that if you don't have a belief in God, you're free to do whatever you want. And I'm here to tell you that you can have that belief all you want, but I'm going to tell you that you worship something. There is something that you worship. If you don't believe in God, there might be something else that you sacrifice for. There are people that sacrifice their families so that they can have a successful career. That's worship. Maybe it's almighty dollar. Maybe it's position. Maybe it's success. I don't know what it is. But we bow down and we give ourselves to something because we were all made to worship. He says, formerly, before you knew God, before you knew God, you were worshiping what is not God idols. 
He explained further that these so-called gods do not even exist in 1 Corinthians 8, 4. And notice the contrast here, though. The first half of Galatians 4, 9 says, But now that you have come to know God, and then he corrects himself, or rather to be known by God. To be known by God. You know, what's so important is not so much how much we know about God. It's not about the facts that we know about God. It's not about the characteristics that we can list that we know about God. We're not talking about facts and mastering a set of facts about God. We're talking about personal knowledge of God, personal relational knowledge of God. And the Galatians conversion says that now that they have come to know God, but then he quickly qualifies and says, have become known by God. Why is that so important? Well, as I was studying this, I came across a book called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. It's a phenomenal book, by the way. And, and J.I. Packer points out on page 36 of his book, he says, he says this about the believer's knowledge of God. He says, the consequence of God taking knowledge of them. In fact, he goes on to write this, what matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me, that I am graven upon the palms of his hands, that I'm never out of his mind. Packer writes, all my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative of knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend and he loves me. And there is no moment when his eye is off of me or his attention is distracted from me. And no moment, therefore, when his care falters. How wonderful it is to understand that we are known by God. That he knows us and that he loves us. I think it's even more fascinating that he, that he knows us. I won't qualify you. That he knows me. Knows every thought and intention of my mind and heart. Knows every action that I take. In, not, not only in public, but in private, and loves me anyway. Are you kidding me? That, that is, that, that's, a, that's the foundation of this relationship. That's what Paul has been trying to get at in this whole thing. He's been trying to get at the idea of relationship. And here he says, before you knew God, hold on, let me qualify it. Before you were known by God, he knows you. God knows you. And he loves you anyway. In his book, Galatians for You, Timothy Keller wrote this, Our knowing of God will rise and fall depending on many things, but God's knowing of us is absolutely fixed and solid. Wow! Come on now. Paul simply cannot believe the Galatians would have such a disregard for, the, for an experience of knowing God and be known by Him. He, he wants them to understand this. Why? Because it's the antidote for idolatry. The antidote for worshiping any other gods is, first of all, to begin to understand how much God knows you and loves you. Richard Lovelace, in his book, Dynamics of Spiritual Life, writes this. He said, Christians who, no longer, who are no longer sure that God loves and accepts them in Jesus, apart from their present spiritual achievements, are subconsciously radically insecure persons, much less secure, much less secure than non-Christians because of the constant bulletins they receive from their Christian environment about the holiness of God and righteousness they're supposed to have. It says their insecurity shows itself in pride, a fierce defensive assertion of their own righteousness, and defensive criticism of others. They cling desperately to legal, pharisaical righteousness, but envy and jealousy and other sin grows out of their fundamental insecurity. When we don't understand that the position of our relationship with God and Him knowing us and loving us first, when we don't begin and understand there, then we will always try to please God through the things that we do. And we will have an insecurity in our relationship with God that when we aren't doing those things, suddenly God must be mad at me. These bad things that happen must be because God is mad at me. Because this didn't work out in my life, God must be mad at me. And our position or relationship with God becomes one in which we're constantly unsure of our relationship with God because it's based on pleasing God. It's based on doing certain things we believe will make us more acceptable to Him. Let me tell you something, nothing that you, nothing, you, you can't do anything anymore to make you more pleasing to God. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. 
So you're doing anything that, that is apart from faith, the Bible says is sin. It's faith. It, it, it's this idea of understanding this faith, and that faith is in the fact that God knows me. That God loves me. That, that, that God is doing everything he can to draw me into relationship with himself. That's a, that's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. Paul reminds us, the gospel shows us that we don't need to make ourselves beautiful and lovable. He already knows us. And if this is the case, we don't need to make an idol out of other people's approval or even our own self-approval. The great and central basis of Christian assurance is not how much our hearts are set on God, but how unshakably his heart is set on us. If we begin to grasp that we are known by God, we won't seek to bolster our self-image or our standing before him through our works. See, Paul is passionate for the spiritual health of the Galatian believers. He wants them to understand that they are known by God and they are loved by God. And in essence, they were, they were enslaved before, but in essence, if they continue to try to just do certain things, and that's what makes them approval, uh, makes them being approved of God in the things that they do, they are enslaved yet again. Galatians 4, 9, and 10. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental prince, elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to become once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. And again, as Paul opened about the formal idols, there were certain things that they did. They had to observe certain things. They had to do certain things. And that's what made them pleasing to their gods. Now they had turned the, the grace of God in their life. They had turned it around. And they had made their observances of the, the things in the Jewish faith and the circumcision and the feasts and all those kind of things. They turned that around. And now they were making that the reason in which they were approved by God, forgetting about the grace of God. And the mercy of God. And they, they came out of relationship with God. Listen, the feasts were not bad things. God established them. Can I just say that up front? The feasts were not. Circumcision was not a bad thing. God established it. The, the certain patterns that we do are not necessarily bad things. The problem is the motive in which we do them. If we do them because we think that's going to earn us favor with God, now we have stepped across the line and we've moved backwards into legalism. Our relationship with God becomes more, more of a slave than one of a servant. A slave than more of a son, I'm sorry. We become more of a slave than a son. Never knowing if we're approved or if we're disapproved. Paul says you're moving back into slavery, not sonship, as we discussed last week. And if we're not careful, I think that we can slip back into looking at religious rituals and practices as a means of pleasing God and gaining his approval. Things like church attendance and reading the Bible and serving in church and doing good works become a means of gaining God's favor and blessing rather than a response to his love and his mercy and his grace. There's a difference positionally, and I'm not saying those things are bad, but I'm saying if you think by doing those things that you're right with God, you're missing it. If you have not come to faith in Jesus Christ and look to him for salvation, but you think that you can outweigh your sin by doing good works and by giving and by church attendance and by serving, you're missing it. There are a lot of religious people that are going to miss going to heaven, that are missing out on the grace of God. The problem is, is, is that oftentimes that becomes more dangerous. You see, when you're following other idols or you're involved in, in different things and from, a, from a sinful standpoint, man, you know you need a Savior. You're like, oh, man, yeah, I keep messing up. I need a Savior. You, you get it. But when you suddenly switch that around and you make something religious out of it and you miss the grace of God but you're doing all of these religious things, you say, well, I'm a good person. Well, I'm okay. Well, why are you Okay. When you don't say because of what Jesus Christ did for me, but instead you start listing, well, I go to church, well, I give to the poor, well, I serve here, well, I do this, well, I do this. You've missed it. That's not what salvation is. It's not by works that any man should boast. It's simply by the grace of Jesus Christ. But once we get the grace of Jesus Christ and our lives become transformed, we can't help but then want to serve him and want to worship him and want to obey him. And if there's something in you that doesn't want to obey God, it doesn't matter how many times you come to church. If that hasn't changed inside of you, then you're missing it. 
you're missing what sonship is all about. Like the story of the prodigal son, we find ourselves more in that, that position where we make it religious of the older brother. You see, there were two, two sons, two sons in the family. The one was, was the one who, who wanted to, to waste everything he had on wild living. He took the father's wealth and, and wasted it on wild living. Based favor with the father. The other based favor on the father by staying. And, and I've served you, I've, I've served you. The problem is both wanted the wealth of their father. The younger brother repented and discovered a relationship through the grace of the father, but the older brother thought he deserved it for all that he had done. And instead, he remained on the outside while the younger brother experienced the richness of the relationship. When we don't understand the relationship, when all we're after is the blessings of God without the relationship with God, when all we're after is favor with God without a relationship with God, we might as well be the older brother because as soon as life doesn't work out or we think that somebody who isn't serving God as much as we are starts to, starts to get favor with God and man, why is God giving them grace and why is God allowing those good things to happen to them? Look at me, I've been over here. I have been in the nursery every Sunday for the last 30 years. And look at them, they barely come to church, they barely, and God is blessing them. I don't understand. Be careful because you're moving into a law-based relationship. You're moving into an older brother relationship. Rather than saying, God, thank you so much for the grace and the mercy and the way that you I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to serve you in this way in the nursery by, by allowing families and allowing those who come the opportunity to be able to worship you without distraction and to be able to invest in these little ones. Watch your attitude. It's so easy to slip into that attitude because we forget how much that our favor doesn't come from, from all the things that we do, but it comes from being known by God. It becomes because we are children of God and we simply come because we want relationship with God. The danger of turning our faith into a matter of works righteousness, that's the danger. Paul now becomes very personal. Galatians 4.11, I fear that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. He, he's a man who's poured himself into ministry. In fact, he uses the, 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 the language of childbirth here. I labored over you. He, he loved the people of this church. Really, seriously. He, he loved the people of this church. And, and, he, and he had an effort here. He said, listen, our relationship has been strained. You don't trust me. These Judaizers come in, and they have tricked you, and you don't trust me anymore. You don't believe. There, there's a fracture in our relationship, but I love you. I have labored over you as someone in childbirth. I have invested, and I want to continue to invest. I care very deeply about you. And so he begins to share his, his example of gospel-centered ministry. And so Paul's looking back at a time when his ministry in, in, in Galatia flourished and relationship between him and these young believers was healthy. And through a very personal exchange, we get a glimpse into what gospel-centered ministry is all about. And what I want to share with you in the remainder of this message is four qualities of gospel-centered ministry. Because there are some of you that are investing. Some of you that know you have been called to invest in the lives of others. Some of you that know that you have been called that as a believer in Jesus Christ like Paul, there are people that you have been called to invest in in terms of gospel-centered ministry. Let me tell you what gospel-centered ministry is. First of all, here's what we learn. Number one, gospel-centered ministry is culturally flexible. Culturally flexible. Galatians 4.12, Brothers, I entreat you because as I am, for I also have become as you are, you did me no wrong. He says, I became like you. Now let me tell you something. There are certain truths, there are certain things in God's word that is the standard and you don't deviate from it. You know what I'm talking about? Certain things that God's word says. But let me tell you something. From a cultural standpoint, I had the opportunity as I, as I shared about uh, the, this church planting school in Tanzania, I had the opportunity to go to Tanzania uh, back in, in February, uh, thanks to many of you sending and being so gracious in that. I had the opportunity to go. Let me tell you something. The way they do church in Tanzania is a little different than the way we do church here. And that's okay. They're worshiping God. There are certain things culturally in their culture that they have to adjust to the way that their culture does things that will never fit or never work in the American culture. And vice versa, there are things that we do, that, 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 that they do there that won't fit here. Culturally speaking, there are times that in order for the gospel message to be able to be preached, for the gospel message to go forward, that we have to be willing to be flexible. There are certain things we have to adjust to. How I many know culture is always changing, isn't it? 
culture is always changing. In fact, our culture has been moving away further and further from the Lord. We've been moving further and further away. Where we once uh, were, were, were a Christian nation, I don't know if I can call us that anymore. We have moved away. There are more and more people, perhaps some of you that are here today and who have come in, that have a very little, very little background in what it means to, 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 to go to church. That wasn't your pattern growing up. You don't know the early Bible stories. There are many people that don't know the early Bible stories. They get Daniel and David and Noah and, and everything else mixed up. And then Hollywood mixes it up even more when they try to do these movies that really don't portray what the Bible says. We have a very culturally mixed up society. What that means is, is that sometimes in order to win those who don't know Christ, in order to be able to lead them to a place of faith, we have to do things differently than we did 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. The approach of ministry has to change. The message of the gospel doesn't change, but the approach, the cultural approach, does change and that was the problem you had Paul who was trying to take a look at where the Gentiles were at and circumcision was one of those things that they did not practice that was a Jewish thing and Paul was trying to say is circumcision a matter of coming to know Christ and salvation or is that one of those things that I can say in this context I don't want to make a stumbling block to those coming to follow Christ but the Judaizers were coming in saying, no, 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 no. We have, to, we have to make sure we do everything just like we did in Jerusalem. Here's the Jerusalem church. It was full of a lot of Jewish people. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. You've got to do it this way. You've got to have the feast, and you've got to do this, and you've got to follow the root, and you have to be circumcised, and you have to do it this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And Paul said, no, 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 no. I didn't come to you that way. I became uh, as you are. Listen, I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. I was one of the top. I understand Judaism, but in order to reach you with the gospel, I needed to find out what is the gospel message. Stay with the gospel message, but become culturally flexible. We, 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 we got to under, if you want to win people in your work and in your community, you've got to begin to learn who they are. You've got to build relationship with them. You've got to understand their background. You've got to understand in which they come. Now, the gospel message doesn't change, but perhaps the language that you use, because you begin to learn their language. Missionaries, when they go, they begin to learn the language of the people. They don't make the people learn their language. There is some language that you can use that is Christianese. We understand that if you've been around church, we can speak it and we get it. Man, I went into the Apple store the other day. They were talking about things. I didn't understand it. They had apple ease. All right? It's just the way it is. You know, there are, there are computer language and people that can talk, and you go in and you go, oh, please speak English to me. Can you, you know, when I was going through all the stuff, we were going to all the doctor's appointments with my, with my dad and going to all those doctor's appointments and things and going in there, there were times I had to stop the doctor. I said, okay, that's great, but what does that mean? Can you help me understand it? Why? Because there's a language that they understood that I didn't understand, and I was asking them to make it plain. Being culturally flexible is all about trying to, to allow people to be able to understand the message of the gospel in a language they can understand. That means that certain things have to change. There are certain things that, quite frankly, we do in church and have always that are simply style. In fact, we are Assemblies of God Church, but if you walk into another Assemblies of God Church, they probably do things different. We may sing some of the same songs. We may not sing some of the same songs. That is all cultural stuff. That is not gospel. So you have to be culturally flexible. Secondly, gospel-centered ministry is transparent. Transparent. Paul opens up, become like me. He, he personally opened up his own heart. And he was so consistent with his life that he could say to them, Follow me as I follow Christ. Become like me. Take a look at me. Is your life as a believer in the way that you follow Christ one in which you can become transparent before those that don't know Christ in a way that you say, you know what, follow Christ as I do. Become like me. If you say, I don't know if I can do that. Boy, let's spend some time in relationship with Jesus and let him bring some transformation so that we can. You know, oftentimes we put on all these fake things. We put all these, these things up. Oh, I'm not like, I gotta be, I'm, I'm like, I gotta be. We, can, we don't get to be open. And if you really wanna, you really wanna reach people with the gospel and gospel center ministry, that means you've gotta become transparent. 
not just about all your strengths and oh man I did, did, did I read the Bible every day and I'm in this and I'm I'm so spiritual and you got to become like me so spiritual. but also in the fact that you know what there are sometimes when I struggle there are sometimes when I lose my temper there are sometimes when I'm not a great parent there are sometimes when I'm not a great pastor there are sometimes I'm tired and when you call me with your problems or leave me a message, there are sometimes when I just really go, oh, do I really have to deal with that? Can't I give that to one of my staff pastors? And you're all looking at me like you're a terrible pastor. I'm a, I'm a human being, right? That, that, but you're a human being, right? But we've got to be transparent. We've got to do life with each other. We've got to be transparent. You know, we've we got to be transparent about our mistakes. We've got to be transparent about, about our struggles. We've got to be transparent about our testimonies. We've got to be willing to be real. That's what Paul is saying. Listen, I'm willing to be real with you. And he shares some very personal things, uh, 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 you know, with them. He shares some very weaknesses. We're going to talk about uh, weaknesses that he had when he was there. That, that he said, I wasn't this great speaker. I wasn't this. I wasn't this. But, but God used it. And that's third right here. The gospel Center ministry looks for opportunities in hardship. In hardship. Galatians 4.13. You know it was because of bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. He's being real transparent. Become like me. And then he says, listen, you know when I first came to you, I had an ailment. Later on in this passage, you're going to say, if you could give your very eyes, you would have. So we're, what many people believe that Paul struggled with his sight. He struggled with his sight. He needed a lot of help. He needed people to come along and help him. It was a hardship. But let me tell you something. Problems become possibilities. It was because of this illness he reminds them that he first preached the gospel to them. Most likely, Galatia either was a, a, a detour, it maybe wasn't a planned spot on the itinerary, maybe it was a, a delayed thing that happened because of his health, but Paul said, listen, these hardships, these things that happened, these were the opportunities that God used for me to be able to preach the gospel to you. These are opportunities. Let me just detour for a moment. Because I, I want to connect back with what we talked about concerning this relationship with God. If our relationship with God and God's favor is based on our personal righteousness or religious obedience, then when hardships come, we're going to be angry at God and shake our fists. God, why did you allow that to happen? God, I, you, I've been serving you. Trust me, I've been there. I've been there. Early on in, 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 in our married life and ministry, when our son Caleb was born, he's a twin, and, and, uh, and, and, and his brother Noah was stillborn, man, I was serving, we were serving God in ministry, and i got to be honest with you, that, that as I was processing through my grief, one of the things that I had to wrestle with was why I was serving the Lord because there was a part of me that said, God, I have given my life in ministry to you. I have served you. I went to Bible college. I've been serving as a youth pastor. I've been given my life and my family. How could you let this happen to us? This isn't fair. This isn't right. How can you be loving? And there were times when I began to question, and I'd go through and I'd say, God, did I sin against you? Is that why you let this happen? Did I do this? And that's why, is this your judgment? Is this? And I had to wrestle through all of those things, and all of those things were lies from the enemy, and they were false, because God, God doesn't, he doesn't punish us based on our obedience or disobedience, and oh, I'm going to bless you here, and I'm not going to bless you here. That's workspace. No, he loves us anyway, but quite frankly, we live in a broken world and there are hardships that come into our lives and it rains on the just and the unjust and what I had to come back to is God I trust you in this relationship because my relationship and favor with you is not based on the things that I do it's not based on my merits it not, it's not based on my sacrifice it's based on your sacrifice and what you did for me and I had to begin to change my understanding of hardship. I had to change my understanding of, of, of suffering. I had to begin to change and say, God, let me understand what this really means. Because our relationship with God cannot be based up and down, up and down, up and down on every circumstance. And whether we feel good or whether we feel bad, whether we feel God's blessed us or whether we feel like we've gotten the shaft. We've got to somehow come back to God through it all, I don't understand but one thing I know, and that's you're good. Circumstances aren't, but you're good. You're good. And somehow, 
You work all things for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And I don't quite get this. I don't quite understand this. I don't know what this is. But my, my faith is based on my relationship with you and your goodness and your graciousness and the fact that you have given all anyway. And any good that I have is simply a blessing from you but not something I deserve. And I may go through things, but I will trust you. That's the attitude. You see, Paul was, was taking a look here and, at his relationship, and, 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 and he begins to understand that the illness that he had and the hardship that he had was really an opportunity to be able to preach the gospel-centered ministry. It gave him a platform. And in, in Galatians 4.14, and, and though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. He says, listen, I didn't, I didn't come in power. I came in weakness. I didn't come in strength. I didn't come in giftedness. I came in weakness. And when I came in weakness, you received me as an angel of God. If Paul had come in in, in, in power, if Paul had come in in a position of strength, who knows who would have heard and hadn't heard. But as he came in a matter of weakness, it, his hardship became an opportunity for the gospel to be shared and for their hearts to be able to receive what he had. And, 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 and Paul continues, we, we read Romans 8, 28, that, that all things, both pleasant and painful, God works for the good of those who love him. And, that, and, and in that case, hundreds of lives here in Galatia had been changed because of the painful illness that overtook Paul. And we here, we have to see an example of how God maybe had thwarted his plans, his ideas, so that the gospel could be shared through suffering. Timothy Keller points out this, God does not promise to bless Christians by removing suffering, but to bless Christians through suffering. Jesus suffered so that, not, not that we might not have to suffer, the, but, but so our suffering could become meaningful through him. God uses our suffering to bring about good. And sometimes it involves circumstances. Paul's illness brought to him new friends and, and a new community and a successful ministry in Galatia. But other times, the, the good God works is in our character. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, Paul talks about an unnamed painful thorn in his flesh. Now, it could have been his eyesight. It could have been something else. We don't know what it was, but we know that Paul says, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and God didn't remove it from me, but rather, verse 7 there says, to keep me from being conceited, and it also says that it strengthened him. Verse 9, that Christ's power may rest on me. He understood how to look at weakness and hardship as opportunities for the grace of God, as the good things that God wants to do in transforming the character whether that is keeping us humble or keeping us in a position where we need to learn how to rest, not on our own strength, but on the strength that God provides. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul writes this, and this is where, where his dependence and sufficiency came. It came in the grace of God. He says, my grace, that's his unmerited love and favor for us. My grace is what? Sufficient for you. What does sufficient mean? It's enough for me. It's enough. It's exactly what I need. It's sufficient. Is the grace of God sufficient for you? Or do you need something else? Do you need something more in order to have a relationship with God, or is His grace enough? Mom, we used to sing that old, that old song. He, you know, uh, grace is enough. Your grace is enough, right? Do we mean it? Is His grace enough? See, Paul understood that his grace was enough. He understood that it was in weakness that he could be strong. He understood that God received all the glory and it was an opportunity for the gospel to be shared. Number four, gospel-centered ministry moves people to Christ's formation. To Christ's formation. Again, we, they, they, these believers welcome Paul as an angel of God. They treated him with great love. Galatians 4.15 then says this, What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you, that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes in giving them to me. What, what Paul begins is a transition through a question, and he says, what's become of your blessedness? But once they were welcoming and, and did great lengths to receive him, and now they were holding him at bay. What's become of that? What's become of your treatment? What changed your, what, what changed your, your, your thoughts to me? What, what changed your ideas about me, about my motives, about what I came to do, about my message? What has changed in this relationship? What has moved out of that where you no longer receive my message? What has changed in that? And he goes on then to talk about this relationship and his motives. This is what he wants for them. This is above everything else. He doesn't care about anything else. This is what he cares about for the Galatians. 
And he says this, Galatians 4, 16 and 17, Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut, shut you out, or excuse me, they want to shut you out that you may make much of them. Notice what he's talking about here is that conflict in the relationship. He's talking about what he comes and what they come. And he says, listen, our relationship, our closeness of our relationship has been impacted by these Judaizers. You once received me, now you don't. Now you consider me an enemy. Well, let me tell you about these people. Let me tell you about their motives. And I think to, to really understand this, we need the message uh, version to really understand. Here's in verse 17 the way the message says it. It says, these heretical teachers go to great lengths to flatter you, but their motives are rotten. They want to shut you out of the free world of God's grace so that you will always depend on them for approval and direction, making them feel important. Gospel-centered ministry is not about a platform to make you feel important. It's not about a platform to get people to depend on you or to look to you and go, oh, wow, I just need to sit under your teaching. You're just amazing. I don't know how you do it. You're so wonderful. Wow. I really need to be, I really, I, I want to have the, I, I want to have the faith that you have. Wow, you're just amazing. Listen, if, you're, if your motives in ministry are all about getting a bunch of people to follow you, you know, you got a Twitter feed and you got a bunch of followers on Twitter or Facebook and you got all these followers or whatever, if that's your motivation is to get people to go, oh, let me give you a pat on the back. Oh, how wonderful you are. It's the wrong motivation. It's the wrong, that's not gospel-centered ministry. That's a people-centered ministry. That's a platform-centered ministry. Elevate me. See how spiritual I am. You need me. You better watch this program every single Sunday or every single week, and you better give to it because that's how you're going to be blessed. Hogwash. There's a whole lot of crap on Christian television. Yes, I said crap. That was the nicest way I could put it. Dung. Paul used dung in Scripture. They used a lot of things in Scripture like that. I'm just going to be honest with you. There's a lot of false teachers that are out there. I'm not calling anybody by name. You've got to be careful. You've got to be leery because when they want you to depend on them, when your prayers getting answers depends on how much money you send them or your grandma sends them, there's a problem. It's not right. It's the wrong kind of motivation. It's the wrong kind of motivation. Motivation isn't that. And look, they will flatter you. Oh, you're wonderful. Oh, you're great. To got to get you to turn around. Oh, you're wonderful. You're great. Oh, how wonderful. Paul says, I didn't come in that way. That isn't the way I came. I didn't, I didn't come in that way. I, I, my motive is not to glorify me. My motive is to glorify Christ. My motive is not dependence on me. My motive is to get you to depend on Christ. In fact, there's a greater motivation. And here's what it is, Galatians 4.19. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until what? Until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Paul says, listen, I'm willing to go through the pain of labor again that I might experience the joy of the birth of seeing Christ formed in you. There is pain. If you're going to be involved in Christ-centered ministry, understand there is pain. People do not get it. They will let you down, and you will have to be willing to go through the pains and, and, and to, to be able to birth Christ being formed in their lives. In order for Christ to be birthed, you've got to be willing to go through the pain. The problem is many of us don't share our faith. Many of us don't get in a discipleship relationship with somebody because it's too messy and it's too painful and we just can't do it. Paul says, no, no, no. Christ's formation, your spiritual health, who, 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 who you are in, in becoming like Christ and dependent upon him, who you are, I'm willing to go through the pain of labor again that Christ would be fully formed in your life. That is what I'm willing to go through. That's the kind of attitude if we want a gospel-centered ministry. The motive has to be Christ formed in those that we are sharing, that they become like Christ, not like us. That they become like Jesus, that they understand what it is to be known by God. And they begin to know God, not from simply a mental standpoint, but from a, a, a heart standpoint as Christ is formed inside. See, this is the basis. This is the basis. So let me ask you as I close today, are you known by God? Do you know God? Are you known by God? Or are you just still depending on following the rules or depending on someone else to know if you're right with God or not? Are you allowing Christ to be formed in you? Gospel-centered ministry is culturally flexible, transparent, 
looks for opportunities and hardship and moves people towards formation in Christ? Is there someone you're praying for? You're passionate for knowing Jesus. Today, I'm not sure what's happening in your life, but let me tell you something. Jesus loves you. He knows you. He loves you. And he wants to transform you from the inside out, not the outside in. He wants to begin to transform your life. He wants you to begin to understand a deepened relationship and a dependence upon him. So what do you need Jesus to do in your life? What do you need Jesus to do in your life? Secondly, who are you praying for to know Christ? Like Paul, who's, who are you zealous and passionate for, for their spiritual health, for their spiritual well-being? Who are you passionate for? Who are you saying, God, this is who I'm praying for. And if it means every day, if it means every day, I'm going to pray. If it means going through and having the tough conversations, the honest conversations, not simply patting somebody on the back and saying, oh, yeah, I don't really want to offend you. You're okay. But willing to speak truth in love. Who, who is it that you care about? Who is it that you're praying for? Who do you want to come to know Christ? Let's bow our heads this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we just, we need you here. Holy Spirit, search our hearts today. Holy Spirit, come right now and search our hearts. Holy Spirit, come. You are the one that reveals. <laughs> you reveal, you know the motives. We can't hide when you're here. We know you know us know everything about us you know who we are oh Holy Spirit and yet you love us hallelujah hallelujah come Holy Spirit if you're here this morning and you say you know what I I I, I want to know Jesus in that relational way I, I need to come to faith in Christ I I need to surrender my life to Jesus I I want to know what it is to be known by him and to know him if that's you this morning will you slip up your hand this morning I want to lead you in that in a prayer of faith today if that's you I, I want to know God I want to be known by God I need Jesus today I need Jesus today hallelujah hallelujah secondly this morning if you're here I just want to ask you is there somebody you're praying for somebody that you're trying to share your faith with, somebody that you're striving with, somebody you're laboring to see Christ formed in their life? Is there, is there somebody you need to say, Pastor, will you join with me in prayer today? Will you join with me in prayer that we would see Christ formed in them? If you've got somebody you're praying for, if that's you, will you slip up your hand? I want to pray for, for that today. I want to pray that. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus, you see all the hands raised. Like Paul, God was zealous that the Galatian people were his opus. And he was zealous that Christ would be formed in them, that his legacy would be one in which his influence would lead people to Christ's formation. So, Lord, these who we're praying for, we want Christ formed in their lives. We want them to understand that you know them and that you love them. Oh, God, you know the men and the women, the brothers and sisters, the children, the parents, the spouses, the work friends, the neighbors. God, you know who we've been sharing the gospel, who we've been praying for. We pray that Christ would be formed in them. Father, I pray for those with their hands raised. I pray that as they go through the labors and the pains of, of, of waiting for you to, to bring about that formation, that, God, you would give them patience and perseverance. That, God, you would allow us to, to recognize and understand, Lord, the motives of our heart and that we would be continually bringing these folks before you, that they would be dependent upon you. Oh, God, we thank you today because we know there's a great harvest, Lord. That's coming of those who you are forming Christ inside. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand today.